Hey Team Pika, and welcome to today's lecture, where today we're going to be wrapping up our discussion of the harmonic oscillator model. Now, I gotta say, I'm pretty excited for today's lecture because we're finally at the point in the course in which we put in a lot of hard effort into understanding some of the fundamentals of quantum mechanics. And at this point, we're ready to tackle some very modern problems in the use of both experimental spectroscopy and computational spectroscopy to solve real world problems. So unlike at the beginning of the course where some of what we were talking about was very kind of 1960s, 1970s chemistry, today, these are the sorts of techniques that my friends in graduate school were using to understand their computational spectroscopy problems. And so I'm really jazzed about today. And I hope you enjoy it. Now, some of the information that we've learned in previous lectures that we're going to apply to today is that in IR spectroscopy, remember that we're studying the process of light absorption in the infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum. That means that the types of motions that we're going to excite in the molecule are vibrational motions. And in fact, because we have this harmonic oscillator model, we can also know that the types of motions that are going to be excited is moving between energy levels in the harmonic oscillator model. It's a good approximation. And so our biggest transition that we're going to see in the IR is the energy change between the ground state of the molecule, that's that nu equals zero level, and the first vibrationally excited state, nu equals one. And from our knowledge of how light interacts in order to excite this vibrational motion, we know that the energy of the photon that's absorbed in the process of exciting this vibrational state is going to be the same in magnitude as the energy spacing as predicted by the harmonic oscillator model. And to remind us one more time, that energy spacing for our harmonic oscillator model is equal to h bar times the square root of k divided by mu remember that k is a parameter of our model that, de that determines the strength of the bond. We call it our bond force constant. And then mu is our reduced mass, which is, remember, that product of our two masses for our different atoms divided by the sum of their two masses. A second thing we want to remember from earlier lectures is that we talked about selection rules as it relates to vibrational spectroscopy. Peaks that we expect to see in the IR are called allowed transitions. And those can only occur when light is able to interact with that vibrational mode. Our two selection rules for IR spectroscopy that will help us determine what modes are vibrationally allowed is that first of all, the vibrational motion has to lead to a change in the molecular dipole moment. And so we saw last lecture that homonuclear diatomics never are IR active. They don't have any allowed transitions. But molecules that either have a permanent dipole moment or molecules like carbon dioxide that can have a dipole moment when they are rearranged out of their equilibrium position, those can have IR active modes. The second selection rule, and we'll have to remember that this is a rule that came out of the harmonic oscillator model, so it might not be a perfectly appropriate selection rule, in real IR spectroscopy, is that the change in energy levels is restricted to delta nu is equal to plus or minus one. So if we look back up at our chart of these different energy levels, that tells us that we would expect to see the nu equals zero to nu equals one transition according to the harmonic oscillator model, but we would expect nu equals zero to nu equals two as a transition to be forbidden and not to be observed in the IR spectra. Okay, and so with that, let's talk about what questions are gonna guide today's discussion. The first question that I've sort of been building up to and leading is this harmonic oscillator model is not perfect. We wanna be able to understand its limitations and the implication of those approximations as it relates to IR spectroscopy. A second guiding question for today is, we've been introducing computational chemistry as a major theme in this course, as a way to be able to interpret and predict and complement experiment. But what chemical insight can we gain through computational chemistry calculations? And can it help us understand IR spectroscopy? The answer to that is yes, and we're going to talk a lot today about exactly how that happens. And then last but not least, 
up until today's lecture, we've restricted our discussion to diatomic molecules. And we want to see how the principles of IR spectroscopy and the harmonic oscillator model that we learned in previous lectures can be applied to studies of polyatomic molecules. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. So two lectures ago, we introduced the harmonic oscillator model, and that was that quadratic potential where we had that the potential energy of our molecule is equal to one half K, that bond force constant, times the displacement, R minus RE, the equilibrium bond distance, squared. And that was a great way for us to model molecular vibration, but we didn't talk too much about why we chose that model or what its limitations might be. So one of our options is to compare this model that we're using to the shape of a real potential energy surface that we could get through experiment, but since I'm biased as a computational chemist, I'm gonna give us based on the results and some very high level calculations. So in this case, the figure that I'm showing is that of an H2 molecule and its potential energy as I slowly separate these two H atoms. And superimposed on top of this, um, you'll see the original figure just tackles hartree fock theory, which we remember is that kind of approximate theory, and FCI, which is even better than coupled cluster in terms of a level of theory for computational chemistry. So we can really trust this purple curve. You'll notice that when I superimpose this harmonic oscillator approximation, again, it should be a nice parabola quadratic potential, that some regions of this potential we capture pretty well we see that near the equilibrium bond distance, the shape of the potential really does look like a parabola. But as we stretch this bond, experimentally and computationally, we see that eventually this H2 molecule is going to dissociate into its two H atoms. And we'll see a flattening of the potential energy curve in what's called the dissociation model. On the other hand, the harmonic oscillator predicts that as we stretch these two molecules, there'll just be an infinite potential energy that incurs as we go to larger and larger bond distances. And so while the harmonic oscillator model is very good for small displacements at large dissociations, this is qualitatively breaking down for us. And so our harmonic oscillator model isn't able to capture this region of the potential energy curve. I also want you to notice that even though we're not qualitatively breaking down with this model at, at small displacements, notice that the harmonic oscillator model is tending a little bit to underestimate the potential energy as I compress the bond and overestimate the potential energy as I stretch the bond a little bit. And that all has implications for the quality of this model and how much I can rely on predictions from the harmonic oscillator model to inform IR spectroscopy. And so because both, all of these approximations are going to limit our accuracy, there's a couple of things we should talk about in terms of how we cope with these limitations in spectroscopy. The first option, and actually a very common option, is to do nothing. Frequently, as spectroscopists, we are only interested in the fundamental transition, going from mu equals zero to mu equals one. And so despite its limitations, the harmonic oscillator model does capture this region of the potential energy surface quite well. What I'm showing in this graph is my harmonic oscillator model with the energy spacings versus a more accurate potential we'll get to in a second called the Morse potential. And while this more accurate potential that can predict dissociations has different energy spacings. Note in particular that in this blue Morse model, the energy spacings start to get closer and closer together as I get to higher energy levels. For this first transition, if I zoom in here to my fundamental transition, both approaches are yielding nearly the same fundamental transition energy. And so if the fundamental transition energy is all you're interested in, most of the time the harmonic oscillator model is okay. And I think this leads to a really good philosophical conclusion about our job as physical chemists is that, and I love this quote or aphorism that Wikipedia tells me is maybe ascribed to George Box, a famous British statistician, but maybe people are using it more generally, is 
that all models are wrong, but some models are useful. And so depending on what we're interested in as spectroscopists, using this harmonic oscillator model can either be great, simple, it helps us calculate the fundamental transition energies, or it can be nonsensical if we're interested in the process of dissociation. And it's up to us to act as sophisticated physical chemists to know where and what circumstances this harmonic oscillator model is going to be a helpful model and where it's going to be dead wrong. If we want to go beyond the harmonic oscillator model, one option is to add on what's called anharmonic corrections. So the way we think about these anharmonic corrections is through something we learned in our calculus class called the Taylor expansion. And what I want to remind us of from our calculus course is that any arbitrary function that we're interested in modeling can be expressed as, as a Taylor expansion. The form of the Taylor expansion, remember, is that we set some point that we're most interested in modeling correctly. In our case, we probably want to choose that equilibrium bond distance. And then we expand in increasing orders of the derivatives that show up for this potential around that point that we're measuring. So in the case of our bond potential, we're going to first calculate what's the potential measured at the bond equilibrium distance. And then to good approximation, the potential at different points away from that equilibrium is going to be given by the first derivative times the distance between, or the, the displacement times the one over the square root of two factorial times the second order derivative times the displacement squared. And we can go all the way up to nth order. And depending how far we go, it depends on what level of accuracy we want to get and how far away from the equilibrium bond distance we want to be able to measure appropriately. So we can simplify this expression a little bit, given some of the physics that we know to be true about our bond association and this bond potential. The first is that in physics, it's only relative energies that matter. And so without losing any generality, I can set that constant term, V of R sub E, to zero. The second thing to note is that the equilibrium bond distance is a minimum in our potential. So right here is our equilibrium bond distance. And since it's a minimum, calculus tells us that that means that first derivative has to be equal to zero. And so we can also neglect the second term in my Taylor expansion. This leads us to a simplified and generally applicable expression that the energy, our potential energy, should be equal to one half k, some parameter that we're going to have to fit to the model, times the displacement squared, plus we can add on additional terms that encounter, include cubic terms for the displacement and quadratic or, and quartic terms for the displacement, depending on our desired level of accuracy. And so the two things that I want us to note in terms of this new expression is first, that leading order term is exactly the same as our harmonic oscillating model that we discussed two lectures ago. So if you're wondering where that term came from, one answer is a physics-based reason. Oh, bonds are kind of like springs and springs are modeled with a quadratic potential. Or you can take a more mathematical approach and say, we don't know what a bond should look like, but I do know based off of Taylor expansions that the leading order term should be quadratic in nature. The second thing I want us to know is that adding additional terms to our expansion gives us a model that has improved fit quality. So in this figure, I'm only showing how this adding on this third order polynomial, this cubic term, can improve the fit quality. But RP, you can see that between our exact model, which I've shown in blue, and our harmonic oscillator approximation shown in red, adding on those cubic terms helps get us better accuracy, shows some of the anharmonicity in the potential, namely that it's easier to stretch the bond than it is to compress the bond. And while it's not perfect, if we kept adding more and more terms to our Taylor expansion, we would be able to accurately model larger and larger displacements associated with this vibrational motion. Now, in terms of nomenclature, it's important to note that these quadratic terms, these harmonic terms, are 
the, the harmonic term is the quadratic expression, and including higher order terms are referred to as anharmonic directions. How many you want to use depends on the problem that you're studying. Every time we add on a new term, you'll notice that there's a new k parameter that we're going to have to fit to the potential. So that's going to increase our modeling complexity, but we're going to get more and more accuracy. The other thing to notice is if you remember from your calculus class, Taylor expansions aren't guaranteed to be very accurate, very far away from that point where you parameterize them to. And so it's not expected that even with these anharmonic corrections that we'd be able to study the dissociation level. And in fact, since we're just including the polynomials, we know that as we get far away from the molecule, our potential energy is either going to go to positive infinity or negative infinity, which we know is not true. We want to get to a constant dissociation. And so before I talk about alternate ways that we can study this problem, let me just point out that our energy expression for the anharmonic oscillator once again looks really similar to that for the harmonic oscillator. But we have a couple of additional terms that help us describe this anharmonicity. Once again, for these energy levels, there's a couple more terms that we're going to have to fit if we want to use these anharmonic corrections. Okay. So what if we wanted to do better and actually be able to study something that correctly predicts the dissociation limit? Well, in this case, the most common potential that's used that's capable of capturing both the bond compression region and the bond stretching region all the way to the dissociation limit is something called the Morse potential. The functional form for this Morse potential is something that was developed empirically, sort of what's a mathematical expression I could use that has the overall right qualitative shape. And what they came up with was that the Morse potential is equal to a constant d sub e called that represents that dissociation energy times one minus e raised to the power of negative beta times the displacement squared. And so for our Morse potential, notice that beta is similar but not identical to that bond stretching constant that we have from our harmonic oscillator model, this time we're dividing by the dissociation energy rather than by our reduced mass. But otherwise, it has some similarities to what our harmonic oscillator looks like and some overlap until we get to that dissociation one where the potentials are quite different. Notice also that the Morse potential, it's still a model of vibrations. And so it's not going to be a perfect fit to any potential energy surface. But nevertheless, the fit quality can be really remarkable for such a simple expression. I'm not going to show you the exact expression for the wave functions associated with Morse potential, but I do want you to see them graph pictorially. And so remember, what we're showing in this picture is our energy levels and the associated wave functions. So even though these blue and green lines kind of look like springs that you could stretch, these are actually representations of the wave functions. And if we mentally squared to get the amplitude and the probabilities associated with these, we can see that the blue and green curves are trying to help us understand where we expect the position of this bond to be and at what bond length we expect the molecule to most probably be found. So at low levels of mu, when we're close to the ground state, the harmonic oscillator model and the Morse potential have very similar looking wave functions. It's only at higher levels, more excited states, that we start to see the differences. And what we see is the difference between the wave functions for the harmonic oscillator model versus that for the Morse potential is that at these more excited states, the Morse potential starts to have an increased probability of seeing the bond in a stretched position relative to seeing it in a compressed position. And that kind of makes sense based on what we know to be the shape of these potential energy curves and what we get to see experimentally. The other thing that I want to point out about this Morse potential is that there are several qualitative features of IR spectroscopy. The Morse potential can predict correctly, but where a harmonic oscillator model is going to struggle. One of those that we've already pointed out is dissociation or bond breaking. 
Morse potential qualitatively describes that great. Harmonic oscillator model qualitatively breaks down in that region. A second piece of information that we get from the Morse potential is the presence of overtones, transitions where the change in energy level is not equal to plus or minus one. So remember, the selection rules for the harmonic oscillator predicted that the V equals zero to nu equals two level transition is forbidden. You wouldn't see it in the IR. The Morse potential predicts that those overtones are going to be observed in the IR, albeit kind of weaker. And that those overtones, as you can see in my graph of the carbon monoxide IR spectrum, are observed experimentally. And so we know that the Morse oscillator is a little bit more accurate in this case compared to the harmonic oscillator. And then last but not least, we see through IR spectroscopy that at, by being able to predict the positions or observe the positions of these overtones, that the energy spacing between levels should decrease as we get to higher and higher values of our quantum number nu. But our harmonic oscillator model predicts all those energy spacings to be constant. And so based on the energy levels of the Morse potential, which I've shown the expression for on this slide, again, it has a couple parameters that we have to fit, but it looks similar to our harmonic oscillator model minus a certain correction term to deal with this anharmonicity and this bond association region. We and our Morse oscillator model are going to get that the energy of the spacing decrease as new increases, and that's much better in agreement with experiment. And so you can see what I mean by these energy spacings decreasing. I'm actually going to show this figure up here. See how in the harmonic oscillator model, this looks like a perfect ladder with even spacings. And then our Morse potential, the distance between nu equals 0 and nu equals 1 is much bigger than the distance between nu equals 5 and nu equals 6. So that's what I mean when I say that these energy spacings are decreasing in the Morse oscillator model, but it's constant in this harmonic oscillator model. Okay, so let's transition a little bit from talking about the different approximations we can use to study vibrations to now tackle how computational chemistry can come to our aid in helping us predict and interpret these IR spectra. Generally speaking, the procedure for using computational chemistry to study IR spectroscopy is very similar to what we've already learned how to do in ChemCompute. And so let me show you some of the settings, some of the settings. Step one is that we're going to optimize the geometry of our target molecule at a desired level of theory. So remember from a couple lectures ago that as computational chemists, we have to choose both a method or a type of theory to use and a basis set. And so for our example, I'm going to start flipping back and forth a little bit between a chem compute calculation that I did earlier today. And I'm going to use CO2 as our example, since that's what we've been focusing on in the past couple of lectures. So I've got my CO2 molecule. It's symmetrized. And I'm going to choose to do a geometry optimization. And notice that in ChemCompute, I also have the option to add on an IR calculation. What's happening when I choose this option in ChemCompute is that ChemCompute is running a vibrational frequency calculation. And because it turns out under the hood, both the geometry optimization and the vibrational frequency calculation rely on me computing the second derivative of the potential, with respect to changes in nuclear coordinates, ChemCompute is going to let me do both steps one and step two all at the same time. So we're going to combine these when we get to our calculation output. But before we do that, I want to show us what it is that ChemCompute is actually calculating for us. Based on our Taylor expansion, we remembered for ourselves that our harmonic approximation would say that parameters we need to calculate are first equilibrium bond distance. We're going to get that once we do our geometry optimization. This is going to give us the lowest energy geometry of the molecule. And two, we need to calculate this K2 parameter, which is the second derivative of the potential 
with respect to the nuclear coordinates. And so it's this d squared v with respect to dr squared that ChemCompute is going to calculate for us along with RE so that it can help us understand where these vibrational frequencies are expected to occur. And although we've talked about some of these anharmonic corrections, most computational chemistry programs that I'm aware of at this time don't incorporate those anharmonic corrections. Or if they do, it's sort of an advanced, non-routine feature, not the sort of thing you'd see on ChemCompute. And so most of the articles that you see on computational spectroscopy, as well as the calculations that I'm going to show you, all implicitly use this harmonic approximation when they do their calculations. Remember I said we also have to choose a level of theory and a basis set to use. As always, our basis set is going to be just whatever we can afford is going to be our best basis set. But our level of theory for spectroscopy, at present, DFT seems to be the best and most widely used balance between accuracy and computational cost. And so in the literature, you may frequently see b 3 lit as the current queen bee in terms of functionals and methods that folks like to use. And that's been the standard for the last many years. But there's new functionals that are coming on the market, constant research that's being done in this area. And so that b 3 lip functional may not be the standard in the near future. Nevertheless, as I set up our calculation, I chose to use this b 3 lip functional. And since I had a little bit of time this morning, I used our triple zeta basis set to try and get the best accuracy possible. And almost like I'm in a cooking show, I'm now going to flip to the tab that shows the results of this calculation. I want to say this took five or 10 minutes to run, so it doesn't happen immediately. It does take a little bit of time to run these triple zeta basis sets. But what we get out when we get our calculation is now not only our molecular orbitals, which we're kind of used to seeing, but also we have a tab that shows us the various vibrational modes of this molecule. And some of these modes, you can see, have very low wave numbers. From our last lecture, we know that that's about the region where we expect some translational motions to occur. We've also got some motions that occur in kind of the tens of wave numbers. Those are rotational motions, not vibrations. But we have four different motions of this molecule that do correspond to wave numbers that occur in the IR region of the spectrum so that's kind of a hint to us that these might be vibrational motions. Clicking on any one of these motions in chemical compute will allow us to visualize what this vibration looks like. And since this is a polyatomic, the vibration or the changes in internal coordinates aren't quite so simple as just a bond stretch. But we do see this would count as a vibrational mode because our internal coordinates are changing. And so we see that chem compute is predicting for us a vibrational motion to occur with a frequency of about 650 wave numbers. And this corresponds to a bending motion. The other really nice thing about ChemCompute is that if you click on this IR tab, it will actually simulate for you what the full IR spectra should look like. And what ChemCompute is predicting for us is two peaks to show up. One peak, which I've shown you what this motion looks like, occurring somewhere around 650 wave numbers, apparently this is sort of a bending motion of CO2. All of our other vibrational motions, ChemCompute is predicting that a vibration occurs at 1371 wave numbers. It doesn't show up in the IR spectrum, and the reason for that is that because this is a symmetric stretch, this doesn't induce a dipole moment as the stretch occurs. So it's present as a possible vibration of the molecule, but not IR active. And then last but not least, chem compute shows for us a different type of stretch. This is the asymmetric stretch of carbon dioxide. And this does involve a change in the dipole moment as the molecule stretches and moves around. And in fact, this motion is predicted to be a very intense IR peak, showing up again just underneath 2,500 wave numbers. What's really neat is that we can use the simulated spectrum to compare to an experimental spectrum 
and see where these peaks in the experimental spectrum are coming from. So if we go to NIST for carbon dioxide, remember I've showed us this IR spectrum in the last lecture. Most of the time when you see IR spectrum, they are always ordered with large wave numbers on the left and small wave numbers on the right. Chem compute is going to put these from smallest to largest. And so we'll show the spectrum kind of in reverse order of how I showed it last lecture by having our small wave numbers on the left and our large wave numbers on the right. And what I want you to notice is that even though the shapes of these wave functions are, sorry, the shapes of the spectrum are a little bit more complicated in experiment, nevertheless, we see a peak showing up around 650 wave numbers. In fact, this peak occurs at 667 wave numbers, which maps really well onto our prediction of the wave number, our bending motion, which can compute predicted at about 650 wave numbers. And then in our experimental spectrum, we also see that peak showing up somewhere around 2300 wave numbers. And chem compute now tells us that that motion of the molecule is the asymmetric stretch of carbon dioxide. And so even though this is a fairly simple system that's been well studied, for more complicated molecules, IR spectroscopy can be used with experiment to see what is happening with the molecule and using computational chemistry as a complement to that experiment to see why that spectrum shows up in the first place. The predictions aren't necessarily perfect. You'll see there's a little bit of discrepancy between the predicted and the experimental wave numbers, as well as some more complicated um, shapes that are showing up in this spectrum. But it really helps in interpretation to do these computational chemistry calculations. If we want a little bit more accuracy, there's a third optional step that we can do when we do computational chemistry. And that third optional step is to scale the resulting frequencies to correct for two factors. One, we know that we have to correct for the anharmonicity of the potential in a way that our computational chemistry calculations don't do for us. So we're going to scale the resulting frequencies to account for that anharmonic effect. That always means because anharmonic effects sort of squish down the potential and the energy spacings, that normally means that our scale factors are going to be slightly less than one. And two, the other factor we need to correct for is that DFT is not a perfect theory. A triple zeta basis set is not as large of a basis set as we could use. And so we're also going to include a scale factor to correct for deficiencies in the level of theory. The good news is that while we could fit those empirically determined scale factors molecule by molecule, scientists have done the hard work for us and developed a number of scale factors that are present and that you can simply look up for varying levels of theory and different basis sets. And so once again, we're back on a NIST website with pre-computed vibrational scaling factors that have been fit to databases of molecules. And you can see that while this table is a little bit overwhelming, you can pick out the level of theory you chose along with your basis set to know what your appropriate scale factor should be. So for the calculation that I just run, where I was using the B3 lift functional and a 6-311G star beta set, basis set, that here, apparently I need to use a scale factor of 0 0.966 in order to get the best results possible. And so I've go, gone ahead and taken the liberty of calculating what our correction should look like for the basis set that we chose in our experiment. Oh, excuse me, I need to do 0 0.967 um, based on the basis set that I chose to match with what we did with temp compute. And if you do this set of calculations, you'll be able to see that compared to experiment, um, our scaling factor can help improve, for example, our relationship between the experimental asymmetric stretch and the computed um, asymmetric stretch. Again, there's still some discrepancies that linger. And in fact, it looks like we made our bend stretch frequency a little bit worse. But nevertheless, on average, these scale factors can help us predict a little bit better 
with respect to experiment. And so last but not least, our last topic for today is going to be to talk about polyatomic molecules. And you've already seen an example of that with our computational chemistry calculation of CO2. But we want to understand why did chem compute predict for us four vibrational modes? And how is it even that we think about a vibration for a molecule that has more than two atoms and so is more complicated than a simple stretch or compression? When studying these polyatomic molecules, we use a harmonic oscillator approximation with the following tweak. What we say is that for a molecule with n nuclei, so for CO2, n equals 3, for this formaldehyde molecule that I've shown as an example, n equals 4, each atom is able to move in three dimensions. And that means that in total, a molecule has three times n degrees of freedom. Three of those degrees of freedom are associated with translational motions, so moving the center of the mass of the molecule without changing any of its internal coordinates. So we need to discount three modes of those degrees of freedom as not being vibrational, but as being translational. Also, some of the degrees of freedom are associated with rotations of the molecule. Again, not changing any of the internal coordinates, but rotating the molecule about its center of mass. For a nonlinear molecule, there are three ways to rotate the molecule. Again, we can spin it about the x-axis, we can spin it about the y-axis, or we can spin it about the z-axis. For a linear molecule like CO2, spinning it about the linear axis doesn't change the molecule at all. So that doesn't count as a rotational motion. And for a linear molecule, that means that there's only two rotational degrees of freedom. Whatever's not a rotational or a translational degree of freedom has to be a vibrational degree of freedom. And those correspond to motions in the molecule where the internal coordinates change. To reasonable approximation, the vibrational degrees of freedom can be expected to behave as independent harmonic oscillators, where the number of expected what we call vibrational modes is given by the formula either n vibe is equal to 3n minus 5 for a linear molecule. Again, that 5 is coming from the fact that we have three translational motions and two rotational motions for a linear molecule. Or for a nonlinear molecule, it's given by n bib equals 3n minus 6 to account for that additional way that the molecule can rotate. For an example, carbon dioxide would expect to have n bib is equal to 3 times 3, since there's 3 atoms in carbon dioxide, minus 5, since CO2 is a linear molecule, and that gives us four expected vibrational modes. So three translational, two rotational, four vibrational. And what's really fun to see is that is exactly what ChemCompute is going to have predicted for us. So in ChemCompute, we see here's one, two, three translational modes. And in fact, ChemCompute will help you see that. Here we have motion about the z-axis, motion about the x-axis, and motion about our y-axis. We get two rotational modes as the molecule is able to spin either about the z-axis or about the, um, sorry, to spin about the x-axis in the first case or about the y-axis in the second case. Again, spinning about the z-axis wouldn't do anything, so it doesn't show up as a rotational mode. And then we have the expected four vibrational modes. And by hand, it's kind of hard to predict what these four motions would look like, but ChemCompute can do the work for us to show us that we have two different types of bending motions, one in the plane and one out of the plane. You can see that out of the plane motion we spin on ChemCompute. One motion that we see is a symmetric stretch, so the oxygen atoms are moving symmetrically with one, about one another. And last but not least, we have an asymmetric stretch, where our carbon is moving in such a way that our CO bond lengths are unequal. And I think that's really neat that our computational chemistry calculations, can we can by hand predict how many vibrational motions to expect, but computationally, we can predict what vibrational motions to expect. And so just like we saw in ChemCompute, 
it's known that there are four different types of vibrational motions for CO2. And in chem compute or in an experimental IR spectrum, the reason that we only see two peaks is that two of these vibrational motions are degenerate in energy. So two different types of bends, same motion, different orientation, so they have the same energy. And then our symmetric stretch doesn't show up in the IR region because it doesn't obey our selection rules and it's a forbidden transition in the IR. Okay, and so that's all that we have for today. There's a few takeaways that I wanna leave us with. The first takeaway is that the harmonic oscillator is a useful but imperfect model for studying molecular vibration. It's really good at calculating the fundamental vibrational frequencies, especially if we do a little bit of tweak to correct for it by scaling those, but it's not good at helping us understand the dissociation of it. If we wanna do better than the harmonic oscillator model, we can improve on it by either adding on and harmonic corrections or by substituting for the harmonic potential, the Morse potential. Either model has an associated set of wave functions and energies and to use either an anharmonic model or the Morse potential, there's a few additional parameters that we have to fit either to experiment or to computational chemistry calculations. Another takeaway from today is that we talked about polyatomic molecules, and we found that the number of expected vibrational modes is given by a simple formula, 3n minus 5 for a linear molecule, or 3n minus 6 for a nonlinear. And last but not least, one of the big takeaways I want us to see is that computation and experiment complement one another. We use computational chemistry to help us assign peaks in the IR region to understand why certain peaks appear and what vibrational motions that corresponds to. But we need that experiment to, in order to see what the exact peaks are and where we would expect them to show up in an IR spectrum of a complex system. And so in general, computational chemistry is designed to primarily help interpret experimental spectrum, but also to help predict experimental spectrum in cases where experimental spectra are either hard to obtain or haven't been obtained yet. A good example of that that we're gonna see in our case study is how that applies to astrochemistry, where it can be really difficult to obtain experimental spectrum of these weird looking molecules and so we use computation in order to really help complement experimental spectrum. And so that's all I've got for us today. I look forward to seeing everyone in class where we can practice some of these computational chemistry calculations as well as talk a little bit more about that complement between experiment and computation. And I'll see you then.